أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقداة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي سدني علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي آمين uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu um, I welcome all of you to our Ramadan uh, Quran Connect program 2021 episode number uh, 10 inshallah so let's go ahead and continue with some of our uh, recap um, highlights of juz number nine, inshallah. So in this juz, uh, inshallah, Surat Araf is going to be continued. Some lessons from the story of Shu'aib alayhi salam are going to be mentioned. Warnings against those who deny the prophets and the messengers of Allah is going to be mentioned. Prophet Musa alayhi salam and his encounter with Pharaoh of Egypt. Pharaoh and his magicians are going to be defeated. That's going to be the highlight of this juz. Also, we're going to see that in this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention about Pharaoh, who's going to continue his persecution of the Israelites. <laughs> Israelites and some more signs uh, are going to be mentioned in terms of um, how the Pharaoh treated his people and the signs which were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa alayhi salam and how um, how the uh, how Pharaoh and his people were tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also in this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention um, the fact that Prophet Musa alayhi salam was given the Torah. Uh, some Israelites, they started uh, worshipping a calf after um, all the hidayah that was given to them after they crossed the Red Sea. Uh, so, the, uh, so they basically um, acted uh, in, uh, while being, uh, so they basically acted uh, in a disobedient way. Also, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention to us in this juz that the Torah and Injil speak about the coming of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise for those who will follow the last Prophet. Some of uh, the highlights of juz 9 also include the fact that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the universal Prophet. Some among the people of Prophet Musa alayhi salam were guided by the truth and they did live by justice. Um, some Israelites transgressed the laws of Allah and due to that they suffered the consequences. The eternal covenant of Allah was taken from all human beings and Allah is going to mention about the last hour. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention to us that shirk has no logic and we should invite to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with the kindness, with the empathy, with compassion, listen to the Quran and always remember Allah. And then in this juz, uh, we're going to begin a new surah, uh, which is going to be Surat Anfal. Surat Anfal is going to speak about the commandments related to the spoils of war, especially alluding to the Battle of Badr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help for the believers in the Battle of Badr is going to be mentioned. Believers must always obey Allah and his messenger, and only the righteous should be the guardians of the Masjid al-Haram. So these are some of the highlights of just number eight and nine. So now again, the highlighted ayah that I have for you all again is the continuation of the story of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. So we're going to continue that inshallah. So let us look at the resume of Iblis, first of all. So the resume of Iblis is that his first name is Iblis, meaning he is someone who has lost hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His last name is Ar-Rajim, meaning he is someone who has been cursed and casted out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is his personal goal? His personal goal includes to destroy mankind. What are his qualifications? The qualifications of Iblis is that he has a unique expertise in tempting, peop uh, in, uh, in tempting people towards evil. What are his accomplishments? His accomplishments include years of experience, more than a million people already has been sent down to hellfire. SubhanAllah. So that is the resume of Iblis. Now let us go ahead and see the resume of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. 
His first name is Adam. His last name is alayhi salam, which we attach to all the prophets, meaning someone on whom is peace. His personal goal was guidance for all humanity. Qualifications included years of experience of worshiping Allah. He was father of mankind because he was the first human ever created. He is elevated above angels and jinns due to the knowledge which was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had a unique opportunity to reside in Jannah, in paradise, and this world for a specified amount of time. So those are his qualifications. His accomplishments include offered valuable lessons to mankind about loving Allah, seeking repentance and thriving to please Allah. So that so now we have the resume of Iblis and Prophet Adam alayhi salam. So now let us go ahead with the story. What is the origin of Iblis? The origin of Iblis is the fact that he is created from fire. Ibn Taymiyyah, he says that most certainly Iblis was not from the angels. However, from his behavior and obedience to Allah, he was from the angels. When it came to worshiping Allah, he resembled the angels. So, subhanAllah, what is the history of Iblis? And it's very important for us to know the history of Iblis because for a long time, for thousands and thousands of years, it was just the jinn living, right? And subhanAllah, Iblis is a jinn. But because of his worship, because of his intense ibadah, he was elevated to be in the company of the angels. And subhanAllah, at that point of time, when none of us existed, Iblis was actually the best in terms of ibadah. There was no one better than Iblis. Even the angels were not as good as Iblis because as we know, angels do not have free will. They are created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But jinns and humans, they are, cre they are given free will. So Iblis, he chose to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his free will. And that's why Iblis was given an elevated station. He was given an elevated position to the point that he was elevated to be in the company of angels. So what happened? After thousands of years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a new creation. Who is this? He is Adam alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took clay from different parts of the earth and created the body of Adam alayhi salam. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the body of Adam alayhi salam, Iblis got to see it. And when he saw his body, some of the narrations mention that Iblis would spend hours inspecting Adam alayhi salam to the point that he realized that this creation is good. And subhanAllah, from that point onwards, he started to feel jealous of Adam alayhi salam. This envy and jealousy took years upon years to grow and fester. And this shows us that sometimes the cause of hasad, the cause of jealousy can be something very small, something very intricate and minute. But if we let it linger, it can lead to a major sin. When someone has hasad towards someone else, they want whatever that person has to be taken away from them and be given to them. This is the type of jealousy that Iblis had towards Adam alayhi salam. He wanted Adam alayhi salam to be debased and destroyed, to be annihilated. And he had this kind of hatred towards Adam alayhi salam, and he wanted this merit to be his own. He wanted this merit, which was given to Adam alayhi salam, to be taken away from him, from Adam alayhi salam, and to be given to Iblis. So then what happened? SubhanAllah, we all know the twist in the story because we just covered it in Surah Baqarah as well as in Surah Araf. 
so we know that Iblis worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all his life, but then he chose to disobey Allah in one episode. And that was the twist in the story. So what is the difference between Iblis and Adam? Adam alayhi salam, he committed a mistake and ignorance. However, Iblis committed a sin out of denial. And there's a difference. For instance, a person who is lazy about praying on time is different from someone who refuses to pray at all. And that's what happened with Iblis. He fell into kufr because he denied following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not out of ignorance, not out of laziness, rather due to mere rejection. So what are the key lessons that we learn over here? The scholars say in the first tribulation, Iblis was put through. He refused to fall into sajda, and as a result, he failed. This shows us that no matter how much pious a person may be, when calamity or fitna befalls on them, their true nature peeks through. And subhanAllah, one subtle thing that we often forget we need to always check ourselves and our taqwa thermostat. We need to always check our taqwa thermostat as to what is my temperature, my temperature of sincerity. Iblis lost the game because he was not sincere. He wasn't worshiping, uh, he was not worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please Allah. Rather, his intention was to prove himself as being the better and best amongst all. Which again leads us to the question, am I worshiping Allah because I love Allah? Or am I worshiping Allah for some other motive? So intentions behind everything really matters. So let us see what are the traps, what are the tricks that shaitan uses. So some of the satanic trip, uh, some of the satanic traps, which he uses, and he goes in a gradual manner through a step by step process, are number one, he entitles a person, he entices a person to commit shit. So this is the major sin. If someone commits this, of course, he loses his dunya and his akhirah. So in, he entices a person to commit shirk. If he's unable to do that, number two, he seduces the person, he tempts the person to commit major sins, al-kaba'ir. So he's gonna involve the person to commit a lot of major sins which we are not supposed to even go near to. Number three, if he's unable to do that, then he entices a person to become involved in minor sins, which are not al-kabayr, which are not major, but still they're minor. And subhanAllah, if there are a lot of minor sins, all those little sins can actually formulate into a mountain and that may ruin us. And subhanAllah, if that doesn't work, he uses an all out attack approach in which he entices a person, he entices a human being through all these measures, through all these steps. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect all of us and without his help, subhanAllah, we cannot achieve anything. So what is the password protection that I can have from satanic traps in order to, uh, in order to protect myself from satanic deception? Number one, seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So making dua. Number two, reciting the Muazzatan, the last two chapters of the Quran, Al Falaq and Nas. Next one, reciting Ayatul Kursi. 
which is in Surah Baqarah, and it is known as the greatest ayah of the Quran. Next one, reciting Surah Al-Baqarah and the last two verses of Surah Baqarah. And again, he said, because Surah Baqarah comprises of almost two and a half juz, of course, it's difficult for majority of us to recite the entire surah in one day. What our teacher recommended to us was to at least recite half a page or one page every single day. And when we're done with Baqarah, we started again. So that each and every day, I am moistening my tongue with Baqarah. Because the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, says, tells us, that reciting Al-Baqarah keeps shaitan away. So we need to do that. Next one, number five, reciting non-specific du'as for protection from shaitan. For example, the morning and evening askar. For example, reciting du'a before we enter restroom. Reciting du'a after we leave the restroom. Reciting du'a before we eat, after we eat, and so on. So there are so many uh, du'as specific for certain tasks, we can do that. Next one, staying connected with the Quran. And it's very important if we keep ourselves connected with the Quran through reciting it, through listening to it, through uh, attending tafasir lessons, then inshallah, we are going to receive, um, you know, this strength from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect ourselves from shaitan and his traps. Next one, learning from the stories of the Prophet وسلم, and the righteous, how they overcame the tactics of shaitan. So that's important as well. And last but not the least, being with righteous companions, because that helps us as well. So inshallah, all these measures are important. And subhanAllah, this is something which is going to go on. This battle is going to continue till we die. So we should know what is, what is the password protection for us in order to secure myself, in order to protect myself from satanic traps. So what do we learn from all this? This entire story, what was the person of going through this entire story? SubhanAllah, the reason why we're discussing this story in detail is because after the story, we will have the story of Musa alayhi salam and Fir'aun mentioned in Surah Ara. Even though there will be other stories mentioned in the surah, but subhanAllah, a close analysis of the story of Adam alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam tells us that they are anchor narratives. And there is a lot of similarity in these two stories. Iblis worshiped Allah all his life, but he messed up at the very end. And he became one of the inhabitants of Jahannam, hellfire. Whereas in the story of Musa alayhi salam, we will see that the magicians hired by Fir'aun lived all their life practicing magic something which is beloved to shaitan and his allies. But subhanAllah, what was their conclusion? They died becoming Muslims. In the beginning of the day, they came with the agenda to please Fir'aun. And they were disbelievers. But subhanAllah, at the end of the day, they died upon Islam. They died reciting the kalima, pronouncing la ilaha illallah with their tongues. And this is the most daunting lesson of the story, which is the fact that conclusion really matters. How we die on, what we die on, it really matters. The Prophet ﷺ said, a person may do the deeds of the people of Jannah until there is no more than a cubit between him and it. Then the decree overtakes him, and he does an action of the people of hellfire, and thus enters hell. Or a person may do the deeds of the people of hell until there is no more than a cubit between him and it. Then the decree overtakes him, and he does an action of the people of paradise, and thus he enters Jannah. Hence, it is narrated that shaitan tries his hardest 
to tempt the son of Adam at the time of death. And he says to his helpers, try to catch this one. For if he gets away, you will never be able to catch him. SubhanAllah. So it's that scary. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all of us a good life and a blessed death. So let us um, conclude our recap with the beautiful supplication that has been taught to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ja'al khayra umri akhirahu wa khayra amali khawatimahu wa khayra ayyami yawma alqaq. Ya Allah, make the end of my life the best part of my life. My best deeds, my last ones. Make the best of days the day in which I meet you. Allahumma ameen. So with that said, inshallah, let us begin our lesson for today. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم so we're going to begin from ayah number 32, Surah A'raf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ قُلْ هِيَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا خَالِصَةً يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمِ يَعْلَمُونَ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who has forbidden the adornment with clothes given by Allah, which he has produced for his slaves, and all kinds of tayyibat, halal, lawful things of food. Say, they are in the life of this world for those who believe, and exclusively for them, the believers on the day of resurrection. Why? Because the disbelievers will not have a share, will not have access to clothes, to adornment, to tayyibat, to halal stuff, and to pleasure and luxury. Allah says, thus we explain the ayat in detail for a people who have knowledge. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but the things that my Lord has indeed forbidden are al-fawahish, the great evil sins, whether they are committed openly or secretly, sins of all kinds, unrighteous oppression, joining partners in worship with Allah, for which he has given no authority, and saying things about Allah of which you have no knowledge. So these are the things, this is the list mentioned to us in bullet points. What are the things that we should refrain from? And every nation has its appointed term. When their term comes, neither can they delay it, nor can they advance it an hour or a moment. So again, when our time has come, when the angel of death comes to us in order to give us the departure ticket, then we're not going to be given even, a, even an hour, even five minutes for us to say to the angel that please wait. Let me have my last word with my husband. Let me seek forgiveness from my parents. Let me pray my fard salah that I was delaying. No, I'm not going to be given one moment, not even a minute or a second. <laughs> Allah now addresses us with our father's name. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh children of Adam, if there comes to you messengers from amongst you, reciting to you my ayat, then whosoever becomes pious and righteous, on them shall be no fear, nor shall they grieve. But those who reject our ayat and treat them with arrogance, they are the dwellers of the hellfire. They will abide therein forever. Who is more unjust than one who invents a lie against Allah or rejects his ayat? For such, 
their appointed portion will reach them from the book of decrees until when our messengers come to them to take their souls. They, the angels, will say, where are those whom you used to invoke and worship besides Allah? They will reply, they have vanished and deserted us, and they will bear witness against themselves that they were disbelievers. So again, what is the irony of a person? Imagine a person who wronged himself all his life and the angel of death comes to take his soul. What is he gonna respond? The person who sinned because of his friends, the angels are going to ask this person, where are your friends now? Can they help you? The person who wronged, who slipped, because of some beloved whom he did not want to displease, the angels are going to ask, where is that beloved now? Can he or she save you? The person who wronged himself because he never prayed because of his work, because of his schedule, because of his hectic routine, the angels are going to say, where is that routine, your schedule, your boss, your co-workers, are they able to save you? SubhanAllah, again, these are the questions that we all pose to ourselves because ultimately, eventually, one day, it is going to be our last day on the face of the earth. Allah will say, enter you in the company of nations who passed away before you of men and jinn into the fire. Every time a new nation enters, it curses its sister nation that went before until they will be gathered all together in the fire. The last of them will say to the first of them, our Lord, these are the ones who misled us. So give them a double torment of the fire. He will say for each one, there is a double torment, but you do not know. The first of them will say to the last of them, you are not better than us. So taste the torment of what you used to earn. So again, we can see from these ayat that the legacy of shaitan is continued. Just like shaitan blamed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that Allah is the one because of whom he, mis he, got, he was misled. Just like that, the nations after him, the people after him who are the followers of shaitan, they are going to blame each other. But each person is going to be tormented accordingly. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jahannam, Allah says, fiha jamia. And the word adaraku means to come down descending, which also tells us the paradigm of Jahannam, the structure, the building of Jahannam, that Jahannam, it gets worse and worse as a person goes down. Whereas Jannah, it keeps on getting better and better as you go up. Allah says, verily those who deny our ayat and treat them with arrogance for them, the gates of heaven will not be opened and they will not enter Jannah until the camel goes through the eye of the needle. Meaning this is something impossible. Thus do we re recompense the criminals, the ones who do wrong. So over here, we see that the people who deny the signs that came to them, Allah says, the doors of the skies will not be even opened for them at all. Because the word used over here is to fattahu. Fattaha means to open, open totally. Just like when you open a door, we use the word fattaha. But to fattahu means to open gradually, slowly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء. For them, the doors of the skies are not going to even open slightly, not even a little bit. Because we all know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when a person passes away, the angels take his soul up to the heavens and they ascend. So for a good soul, the heavens are going to be opened. The doors are going to be open and it's going to ascend. 
However, the evil soul, for him, the doors of the heaven, the doors of the skies are not going to open even a little bit. Allah says, and they're not going to enter Jannah until a camel enters the eye of the needle. And this was an Arabic idiom, which meant that this can never happen. These people can never enter Jannah. And subhanAllah, we all know that if a person commits good deeds, they are good, then they are going to be from the Aliyin. But if their deeds are evil, if they committed sins, then their end is going to be that they are going to be from the people of Sajjeen if they died upon evil. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us from Jahannam because Allah says in ayah 41, theirs will be a bed of hellfire and over them coverings of hellfire. Thus do we recompense the wrongdoers. And mihad, it's actually coming from the word mahad, which means cradle. So just like a cradle hugs the child from all around, that's how Jahannam hellfire is going to hug the person. And not just that, Allah says they're going to be having additional coverings of hellfire. Because in a cradle, of course, the bottom and the sides are covered are covering the child, but subhanAllah, the up is exposed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even over them, on top of them, there are going to be coverings of Jahannam. May Allah protect us and may Allah guide all of us. But those who believed and worked righteousness, we tax not any person beyond his scope. Such are the dwellers of Jannah, they will abide therein forever. So Allah explains us in this ayah that Allah does not burden a soul beyond its means. Meaning at times we are tested through a disease, through an ailment or sickness. When that happens, what does a believer do? He stays patient. He practices sabr. And that is a means of reward for him. And when the sickness accelerates, for example, from stage one cancer, now if the person proceeded to stage four cancer, and during the process, the person loses his life, even in this is higher for him. Even in this is good for him, is goodness for him, because it's part of Allah's mercy that Allah does not burden anyone beyond his capacity. So what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves this person from all sorts of pain, injuries, and medications, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him death. Allah says, and we shall remove from their chests any mutual hatred or sense of injury which they had in the life of this world, rivers flowing under them, and they will say, all praise and thanks are to Allah who has guided us to this. And never could we have found guidance were it not that Allah had guided us. Indeed, the messengers of our Lord did come with the truth and it will be cried out to them. This is the Jannah. This is the paradise which you have inherited for what you used to do. So beautiful dua. Actually, we should say this as well. Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Because in this dua, in this supplication is actually a lot of shukr, a lot of gratitude that, Ya Allah, all praise and thanks to you that you guided us. Because before this guidance, we were in ignorance. We were living in darkness. So it's only because of you. And this ayah is so beautiful because Allah is describing the scene of Jannah. That when people will enter Jannah, when they enter paradise, they're going to thank Allah and they're going to say all praise and thanks to you. So they're going to give the credit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's your favor of guidance upon us. But subhanAllah, look at the conclusion of this ayah. What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds? He gives the credit to us, to the believers. And he says, today you have inherited this Jannah because bima kuntum 
because of what you used to do. SubhanAllah, he gives the credit to us. What a beautiful ayah. The people are going to give the credit to Allah and Allah is going to give the credit to people. SubhanAllah, what beautiful relationship that's going to be. What beautiful love and atmosphere of peace that's going to be. You know, just like, um, you know, when there are two friends and a friend does something to a friend, the other friend, he or she is so happy that she says to her friend that, you know, today, the position that I have, the grades, the good grades I got, it's because of your help. SubhanAllah, you helped me throughout the year. You were there for me. You always answered my questions. It's because of you. And the other friend says, no, no, it's not because of me. It's because of all the hard work you put into this. So today is your day. Celebrate. It's your day because of all the hard work you do. And imagine that kind of a relationship is a beautiful relationship of friendship, right? Because none of them are taking the credibility to themselves. And they're giving the credit to other. Subhanallah. So yes, Jannah is going to be the ultimate state and abode of bliss. So Allah describes further, he says, and the dwellers of Jannah will call out to the dwellers of Jahannam, saying, we have indeed found true what our Lord had promised us. Have you also found true what your Lord promised? They shall say yes. Then a crier will proclaim between them, the curse of Allah is on the wrongdoers. And this tells us that yes, even after the matter is decided, even after the positions are settled, even after the people have entered their homes, whether it's Jannah or Jahannam, they will be able to interact with each other. They will be able to communicate with each other. Allah says, those who hindered men from the path of Allah and would seek to make it crooked, and they were disbelievers in the here, and they were disbelievers in the hereafter. And between them will be a barrier screened. And on Al-A'raf, Al-A'raf literally means a wall which has elevated place, a wall with elevated station. Allah says, on this Araf, after which the surah is named after as well. Allah says, on this wall will be men who would recognize all the people of Jannah and Jahannam by their marks. So the dwellers of Jannah are going to be recognized by their white faces, and the dwellers of Jahannam are going to be recognized by their black faces. And they will call out to the dwellers of Jannah by saying, Salamun alaykum, peace be on you. And at that time, they, the men on Araf, will not yet have entered Jannah, but they will hope to enter with certainty. So Allah says, Wahum yatma'un. They are going to be in between Jannah and Jahannam. So they will be able to see both the scenes. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people of the heights. Who are the people of the heights? These are the people who have pending cases. Because their positive side was not so strong as to grant them admission into Jannah. And their negative sides were not so weak as to condemn them, condemn them to Jahannam. Therefore, they will wait for the decision of their case on the height which is going to be between Jannah and Jahannam. And they're going to be yatma'un. Yatma'un coming from tama, which means to have a deep burning desire of something in your heart that you really want to achieve. So this burning desire is going to be in their heart, which they're not going to be, which they're not going to express but it's going to be a burning desire in their heart, deep down. Allah says, and when their eyes will be turned towards the dwellers of Jahannam, they will say, our Lord, place us not with the people who are wrongdoers. وَإِذَا صُرِفَتْ أَبْصَارُهُمْ And Surifat is actually passive. 
It's not active voice, it's passive voice, which means that they will not even want to look at the people of Jahannam, but their eyes are going to be turned. So they are forced to look at them. And when they look at them, they are going to make dua. They're going to supplicate to Allah that, Ya Allah, protect us from becoming the inhabitants of Jahannam. So subhanAllah, these are the people who are going to have their deeds even. Their good deeds and their evil deeds are going to become even. So they will have to wait. And the men on Araf will call to the men whom they would recognize by their marks, saying, of what benefit to you were your great numbers and hordes of wealth and your arrogance against faith? So we can see that the inmates of Jannah and the inmates of hell and the people on the heights, they're all going to be interacting. And from this, we can come with, we can formulate some type of idea of how strong the faculties of men are going to be in the next world. The faculty of sight will become so strong that the people of Jannah and those of Jahannam and on the heights will be able to see one another whenever they will desire to do so. Likewise, their faculties of speech and hearing will grow so strong that the people of these three different worlds will be able to carry on their dialogues without any hindrance. SubhanAllah. And when we think about it, many times we think, okay, at least if I'm not entering Jahannam, at least if I be from the people of Ara, I shall be good because I will not enter Jahannam. But SubhanAllah, even this dua is not valid enough because when we ask dua, when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should ask for the best. So we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Jannah. And even in that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommended to us, he encouraged us, he persuaded us to say, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannatul Firdaus, because that is the best station of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are they those of whom you swore that Allah would never show them mercy? Behold, it has been said to them, enter Jannah, no fear shall be on you, nor shall you grieve. SubhanAllah, so we see that these people are going to stay waiting on the heights for a specified amount of time. But after that time is over, then inshallah, they are going to enter Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to permit them to enter Jannah. I number 50, and the dwellers of the fire will call to the dwellers of Jannah saying, pour on us some water or anything that Allah has provided you with. They will say both water and provision Allah has forbidden to the disbelievers. So Allah made certain things haram in life, but these people, they made it halal for themselves. So Allah is going to make something which is halal, which is water. Allah is going to make this haram for the dwellers of Jahannam. So this is something very scary. And this scene itself, the imagery is very scary. And we should only seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Jahannam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 51, who took their religion as an amusement and play and the life of the world deceived them. So this day we shall forget them as they forgot their meeting of this day and as they used to reject our ayat. Certainly, we have brought to them a book, the Quran, which we have explained in detail with knowledge, and it is a guidance and a mercy to a people who believe. So when we talk about misyan, forgetfulness, forgetfulness is of two types. One type is when we forget out of ignorance. So we say, oh, I forgot to do my assignment today, but I'm going to do it tomorrow. So they're being lazy. 
But then the other type is forgetfulness out of rejection, out of denial. And this is something which is completely forgotten. So the people who completely forgot their akhirah and they preferred the life of this world, for them is going to be Jahannam. May Allah protect all of us. Await they just for the final fulfillment of the event. On the day the event is finally fulfilled, those who neglected it before will say, verily the messengers of our Lord did come with the truth. Now are there any intercessors for us that they might intercede on our behalf? Or could we be sent back to the first life of the world so that we might do good deeds other than those evil deeds which we used to do? Verily, they have lost their own selves, and that which they used to fabricate has gone away from them. Indeed, your Lord is Allah, who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he rose over Istava, the throne. He brings the night as a cover over the day, seeking it rapidly, and he created the sun, the moon, the stars, subjected to his command. Surely he, his is the creation and commandment. Blessed is Allah, who is the Lord of the Alameen. So again, we can see the agony of the people that when they're going to be in Jahannam, they are going to wish that someone can intercede for us so that we're pulled out of this abode, of this residence. They're going to pray that give us one more chance, Ya Allah, so that we can go back and correct ourselves. But there are not going to be any second chances. They're not going to be given any second chances. Allah says, invoke your Lord with humility and in secret. He likes not the aggressors. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that now that we have life, now we have chances, now we have opportunities. So while we have that, what should we do? We should invoke Allah with humility and in secret. So the word used over here is tadarru'a wa khufya. So what is tadarru'a? Tadarru'a means it is a combination of khashya and khudu. Khashya means to feel physically being overpowered when we are praying. And khudu means to emotionally feel overpowered when we are in the state of worship. And when these two factors are combined, it forms the word tadarro, which adds the third dimension to this word, which means to get closer to somebody slowly and quietly and secretly in a most beautiful manner when you physically and emotionally feel overpowered by an authority. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are a true believer, then you should invoke your Lord with humility and in secret. So we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times of secrecy. So yes, alhamdulillah, we go for taraweeh. It's an amazing prayer, which brings us a lot of reward. Yes, we are together with the imam asking and begging Allah and making dua. But it is recommended and highly recommended by the Prophet ﷺ to have some moment one-on-one -on -one with Allah. To have few minutes per day when we are actually interacting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alone and in secret. And that could be any time that we can fix on our own. It can be 15 minutes before iftar when we can just make everything ready, have everything ready and just close the door, sit, on our, sit in our room and just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is the time of acceptance of dua when a person breaks his fast. So we can do that. If that's a busy hour, we can make sure that we make some time out. We have some time out before Fajr which is the time of the Hajjad, whether it's 10 minutes, whether it's half an hour, any time. And we should try to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging and crying so that I know that it is only me and him. 
and no one else. So by tears, my sincerity, my ikhlas is only for him. And that is something which is very much loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I number 56, and do not do mischief on the earth after it has been set in order and invoke him with fear and hope. Surely the mercy of Allah is ever near to the doers of good. And it is he who sends the winds as heralds of glad tidings going before his mercy, which is rain. Till when they have carried heavy laden clouds, we drive it to a land that is dead. Then we cause the water to descend thereon. Then we produce every kind of fruit therewith. Similarly, we shall raise up the dead so that you may remember or take heed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the water cycle, how the dead land produces fruits, produces flowers. How we see that all the trees, they become bare naked in winter, but subhanAllah, they just bloom with flowers when spring arrives. Just like that, in a similar manner, once everything is destroyed on the day of judgment, each one of us are going to be resurrected and we're going to be raised up to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to meet him. The vegetation of the good land comes forth easily by the permission of its Lord, and that which is bad brings forth nothing but a little with difficulty. Thus we do explain variously the ayat for a people who give thanks. So the word used over here is nakida, and nakida means um, when a person does a lot of hard work to acquire something, and they finally acquire it but it doesn't give them a lot of benefit. It doesn't give them a lot of produce, except for very little. And subhanAllah, that is a state of a person who started off with evil. So two students, for example, one works really hard throughout the year to attain good grades. And on the other hand, the other student, he cheats really hard to attain good grades. So maybe he gets some grade, he gets a C or a D, whatever, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he's not going to gain much benefit. Even though he worked really hard to cheat, but because his origin was wrong, the core was wrong, that's why it's not going to bring him much benefit. So again, this whole concept that we're not going to do anything, we're not going to do any good deeds, but yeah, right before we die, we're going to go to Hajj, we're going to perform a lot of good deeds, or we're going to say istighfar, and we're going to just um, succeed. We're going to be free, we're going to be uh, successful, and we're going to get the free pass to Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the vegetation of good land comes forth easily by the permission of its Lord. So we have to work on this vegetation throughout our life so that inshallah we can reap its produce in akhirah. Indeed, we sent Nuh to his people and he said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. La ilaha illallah. Certainly I fear for you the torment of a great day. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us a story of another prophet, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. So who is Nuh? Nuh alayhi salam came after Adam alayhi salam. He is from one of the Ulul Azam, means the five greatest prophets. He is one of them. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says that the period between Adam and Nuh was 10 centuries. So for a long time after Adam alayhi salam, the people were on Tawheed. They worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were on the right track. However, uh, generations later, um, when pious people, they passed away, shaitan tempted these people to make pictures out of them and put them on a wall so that they can remember them and do deeds of righteousness, perform good deeds. But subhanAllah, as generations passed by, as you know, offsprings and children died and the next generation came about, what happened? they lost the purpose and the whole reason behind putting these pictures, behind instilling these statues 
And then Shaitan formulated them to think that these are actually not pious people whom you remember in order to do good deeds. Rather, these are idols and they are gods in whom you seek help from, whom you worship. So that's how shirk crept into the nation of Nuh salam, and Nuh salam gave da'wah to them and called them to pure tawheed, to worship only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. So ayah number 60, the leaders of his people said, verily we see you in plain error. Nuh said, O my people, there is no error in me, but I am a messenger from the Lord of the Alameen. So these are the mala, and mala are the influential people of the society, the elites of the society. So Nuh salam is warning them and giving them the message of Islam, but these people are not accepting it. So Nuh salam says to them, I convey to you the message of my Lord and give sincere advice to you. And I know from Allah what you do not know. And ansahu comes from noon sadha, which means to give a valuable word for someone for whom you want good. So that is a nasiha, a good word, a good word of advice. And you're not giving it because you are gaining any benefit out of it, but you're only giving this piece of advice for their own good. He says, do you wonder that there has come to you a reminder from your Lord through a man from amongst you that he may warn you so that you may fear Allah and that you may receive his mercy. But they denied him, so we saved him and those along with him in the ship and we drowned those who denied our ayat. They were indeed a blind people. SubhanAllah. So some snapshots of different stories of the prophets are going to be mentioned in Surah Araf. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us some scenes from his story that how, how effort, you know, how much effort Nuh alayhi salam exist, uh, exerted on these people to call them to Islam. However, a very few people believed in him. And SubhanAllah, these were the very few people who were saved when they were on board the ship and all others were drowned. I number 65, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about another nation, Allah says, and to add their brother Hud was the one we sent. He said, oh my people worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. None has the right to be worshiped but Allah. Will you not fear Allah? So the people of Ad are next in the chronological order after Nuh alayhi salam. And what was their problem? Their problem was that they used to make high buildings as landmarks. And due to this, they became very proud. They became very obstinate and they started rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, the root cause was shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us the story of Adam alayhi salam and Iblis. Why did Iblis deny to bow down to Adam alayhi salam? It was based on pride isn't it? It was based on boastfulness, arrogance. I am better than him. So all the followers of the Iblis, they follow the same legacy. Then they feel that we're better than someone. We're better than the prophet who's calling us to Islam. Then we're not going to obey him. We're not going to listen to him. So what did the leaders do? Allah says, the leaders of those who disbelieved among his people, they said, verily, we see you in foolishness, and verily, we think you are one of the liars. Hud salam said, O my people, there is no foolishness in me, but I am a messenger from the Lord of the Alameen. I convey to you the messages of my Lord, and I am a trustworthy advisor. Again, the same word, nusadha, is used which means I'm not giving you all this advice because I am gaining any benefit out of this. It is for your own good. Do you wonder that there has come to you a reminder from your Lord through a man from amongst you to warn you? And remember that he made you successors after the people of Nuh 
and increased you employ in stature. So remember the graces bestowed upon you from Allah so that you may be successful. So the very few people who remained who were on board with Nuh السلام, on the ship this was their children and their progeny and their offspring who multiplied later on, years later, and then decades later, they were the one who transgressed against their prophet, Hud alayhi salam. They said, have you come to us that we should worship Allah alone and forsake that which our fathers used to worship? So bring us that wherewith you have threatened us if you are of the truthful. Who said, torment and wrath have already fallen on you from your Lord. Dispute you with me over names which you have named, you and your fathers with the no authority from Allah. Then wait, I am with you among those who wait. So we saved him and those who were with him by a mercy from us. And we cut the roots of those who denied our ayat. And they were not believers. So it's mentioned that when they became, when they become more advanced in their kufr and in their denial and in their rejection, then the torment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seized them. And what was this torment? It is said that the weather changed suddenly one day and a furious, violent wind destroyed them. And this wind was imposed on them for seven nights and eight days continuously until the lush green land turned into ruins and swallowed by sands of the desert. And if we imagine, subhanAllah, and compare it to any tornado that we, um, you know, that we know about or that we hear on media, subhanAllah, if a tornado hits a city just for a few minutes, it's able to destroy houses, and vehicles and buildings and entire cities just within minutes. And imagine it's not few minutes, it's not few hours, it is seven nights and eight days that this tornado continued to progress. Astaghfirullah. So this is the result of denial, of arrogance, and that's how those people were destroyed. However, Hud السلام, had few people who believed in his message, so they were saved, and they migrated to a place called Hadramaut, which is now known as Yemen. And subhanAllah, from their children and their children and their offsprings came about the nation of Thamud. So Allah is going to mention that. Allah says, and to Thamud, we sent their brother Saleh. He said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. None has the right to be worshipped but Allah. Indeed, there has come to you a clear sign from your Lord. So what was this clear sign? The clear sign was that Allah had, uh, they had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them a miracle, to give them a sign so that they can believe that this is a true prophet of Allah. So they demanded a miracle, just like the Ahl al makkah they asked the Prophet وسلم, to show them a miracle, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the moon to split into half. Just like that, similarly, these people asked for a miracle, and what did they ask? They asked uh, Hud, uh, sorry, they, they asked Salih السلام, to present to them a huge she camel, which would come out of a rock. So it would just come out miraculously, it is not born out of something. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did accept their request. And this miracle did take place. So the ayah says, this she camel of Allah is a sign to you. So you leave her to graze in the earth of Allah and do not touch her with harm, lest a painful torment should seize you. So when this miracle took place, the command was given to them that now that the miracle has taken place, now your instruction is that you cannot harm this she camel because she is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She's one of the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you try to harm her, then the warning is that you are going to be afflicted with a painful torment. So Allah says, and remember when he made you successors after Ad, 
and gave you habitations in the land, you build for in for yourselves palaces and plains and carve out homes in the mountains. So remember the graces bestowed upon you from Allah and do not go about making mischief on the earth. So these people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these people were given bawa'akum, meaning that they were living in the most perfect circumstances. They had what they desired. They had the ideal school, ideal community, neighborhood. Everything was perfect. The commute was perfect. That's how lavishly these people were living. So even though um, their ancestors, ah, they were also good architects, these people, Thamud, were actually masterminds in architecture. So what they would do is that they would carve out magnificent castles in the mountains. So not on top of the mountains, just like Ad would do. They would carve magnificent castles in the mountains, which is something very hard. And still, we are not able to do it. And subhanAllah, the remains are still to be found. And they were scientists and craftsmen. So subhanAllah, they were very, very successful in terms of the abilities they had. But yet, what did they do? They rejected their prophet. They rejected the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they harmed the she camel. They harmed the she camel. So Allah says, the leaders of those who were arrogant among his people said to those who were counted weak, to such of them as believed, know you that Salih is one sent from his Lord? They said, we indeed believe in that with which he has been sent. To the arrogant ones, they tried to... Um, instill doubts in the hearts of the weak people by saying, are you sure this is a true prophet? Are you sure Islam is the right religion? But what did they say? Yes, we have full assurity and we're certain that we indeed believe in this prophet that Allah has sent him to us for our guidance. So what did the arrogant ones do? Allah says, those who are arrogant said, verily we disbelieve in that which you believe in. And that's one of the legacies and tricks of people who want to um, deceive other people. What do they say? That they try to instill doubts in the hearts of people. That, okay, fine, if you believe in this, we don't. And that's one of the strategies so that the other person can think, oh, really? You don't believe in this? Hmm, maybe I am wrong. And then they, starting, they start doubting their own beliefs. <laughs> And then what else did they do? They killed the she camel and insolently defied the commandment of their Lord and said, O Saleh, bring about the torment if you are indeed one of the messengers. So they not only harmed the she camel, but they even demanded their prophet to bring the punishment onto them. How much arrogance is this? How much audacity they have to say this? So what happened? The earthquake seized them and they lay dead, prostrating in their homes. And then he, Saleh, turned from them and said, O oh my people, I have indeed conveyed to you the message of my Lord and have given you good advice, but you do not like good advisors. So what do we learn from this? We learn from this that we really need to make dua, not just for our children, but even for our offspring, even for the next generation. Because it's not necessary that if you are the ones who are guided, it is not necessary that the next generation will be on hidayah too, will be on guidance too. Because in all these stories, what is common? The common thing is that the small group of people who believed in Nuh salam, their number multiplied until the point that they became a nation on their own and when a prophet was sent to them, they denied him. Same thing happened with Ad. Same thing happened with Samud. So we really need to make dua, not just for our family members, but for our communities, for our generations, for our youth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the next prophet. He says, and remember Lut, when he said to his people, do you commit the worst sin such as none preceding you has ever committed in the alameen? 
in the mankind and jinn? Verily, you practice your lusts on men instead of women. Know that you are a people transgressing beyond bounds by committing great sins. And the answer of his people was only that they said, drive them out of your town. These are indeed men who want to be pure. So again, we see another aspect, another dimension of arrogance that because they want to disbelieve, what do they say to the other people who are believing in the message of their prophet? That stay away from them. They are the people who really want to act pious. They are the people who really want to show off. They are the people who really want to prove themselves as being the good people, as being the righteous people. So again, they tried to tempt them. They tried to instill doubts in them. But subhanAllah, the people who believed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. So Allah says, then we saved him, Lut alayhi salam, and his family, except his wife. She was of those who remained behind in the torment. And we rained down on them a rain of stones. Then see what was the end of the criminals, of the polytheists. So these people, this nation, they were not just involved in, um, in arrogance because of the fact that they were really advanced in terms of their culture and in terms of their um, politics, in, in terms of their buildings and architecture, but subhanAllah, these people got involved into some serious bad habits. And this was homosexuality. And this is something which their prophet is even telling them and warning them against that you are committing such wrong, which has never been committed on the face of the earth by anyone. But still these people persisted on the sin. And subhanAllah, we learn that as time passes by, there are things which could be poison at a time, and now it has become a medicine for others. And how does that happen? Just with the factor of time. Just like when we learn about history, it's mentioned, um, you know, that the American Psychological Association, APA, in the 70s, it actually listed homosexuality as a psychological disease. So in the 50s and 60s, they would call people who would indulge in homosexuality as if that they are sick. And they would quote people that this is something which is an abomination unto the Lord. And the psychiatrists back then in the 1950s and 60s called this as a mental illness. And they suggested treatments for it, like shock therapy or drug therapy. However, just decades later, in 1980s, the response to it changed to personal choice, to alternate lifestyle, to the motto that there are different strokes for different folks. And subhanAllah, now the psychiatrists have stricken that that mental illness by another mental illness, which they now call it as homophobia. And homophobia is actually termed for those people who are against homosexuality, who despise homosexuality. So we can see, subhanAllah, how the times have changed, how the people have, have progressed. It is the same mind same intellectual capacity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed to all the people, to all mankind from the beginning of time till now. But subhanAllah, with the passage of time, how shaitan plays tricks with us and we fall into it. Astaghfirullah. And now Allah will mention about another nation who are going to come from the generations, from the offsprings of these people of the nation of Lut alayhi salam who survived their offsprings and their generation down the line many years later is going to include the people of Madian. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and to the people of Madian, we sent their brother Shu'aib. He said, oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other ilah but him. Verily, a clear proof sign from your Lord has come to you. So give full measure and full weight 
and do not wrong men in their things and do not do mischief on the earth after it has been set in order, that will be better for you if you are believers. And do not sit on every road threatening and hindering from the path of Allah, those who believe in him and seeking to make it crooked. And remember when you were but few and he multiplied you and see what was the end of the mischief makers. And if there is a party of you who believe in that with which I have been sent and a party who do not believe, so be patient until Allah judges between us and he is the best of judges. So after Lut alayhi salam, down the line was Shu'aib alayhi salam. And his nation lived in Madian where they indulged in a lot of economical problems. So they would cheat and they would steal and they would be unfair in terms of their transactions. So Shu'aib alayhi salam preached them to stay away from this, to refrain from this. However, what happened? They rejected his message. They did not listen to the advice presented to them. And ultimately, even they were tormented. They were afflicted with a heavy rainfall and a loud noise, which caused them to die. So now we're going to begin, which is number nine, Surat Araf, ayah number 88. So let us listen to the recitation. <laughs> قال الملأ الذين استكبروا من قومه لنخرجنك يا شعيب والذين آمنوا والذين آمنوا معك من قريتنا أو لتعودن في ملتنا قال أولو كنا كارهين قد افترينا على الله كذبا إن عدنا في ملتكم بعد إذ نجان الله منها وما يكون لنا أن نعود فيها إلا أن يشاء الله إلا أن يشاء الله ربنا وسع ربنا كل شيء علما على الله توكلنا ربنا افتح بيننا وبين قومنا بالحق وأنت خير الفاتحين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسأل Okay, inshallah, translation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the chiefs of those who were arrogant among these people said, we shall certainly drive you out, O Shu'aib, and those who have believed with you from our town, or else you all shall return to our religion. He said, even though we hate it, we should have invented a lie against Allah if we return to your religion after Allah has rescued us from it. And it is not for us to return to it unless Allah, our Lord, should will. Our Lord comprehends all things in his knowledge. In Allah, we put our trust. Our Lord, judge between us and our people in truth. For you are the best of those who give judgment. And again, this is a beautiful dua to learn and to apply. Because Shu'aib alayhi salam's story, uh, in, in this story, we are mentioned about um, the fact that how Shu'aib alayhi salam gave, gave them da'wah and still his nation persisted to reject him. And from this, we analyze that if somebody gives me nasiha, if somebody gives me suggestion or an advice, what does my heart feel? Does my heart feel burdened to accept it? Because this nation was involved in cheating and deception. When they were told not to do this, they became more arrogant and they became more defiant in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in order to clear our heart, in order to stay away from the tactics of shaitan, from the traps of shaitan, this is a beautiful dua to say, which is, رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَا قَوْمِنَا بِالْحَقِّ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الْفَاتِحِينَ O oh, our Lord, judge between us and our people in truth, for you are the best of those who give judgment. 
because at times our friends say something which is contradictory to the Quran and Sunnah. Sometimes we hear stuff on social media or through um, someone from our family members and it seems conflicting with Islam and its values. So again, if we make this dua, then inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to grant us with the best of judgment, with the best of decisions. I number 90, the chiefs of those who disbelieved among his people said to their people, if you follow Shu'aib, be sure that you will be from the losers. So the earthquake seized them and they lay dead, prostrating in their homes. Those who denied Shu'aib became as if they had never dwelt therein. Those who denied Shu'aib, they were the losers. Then Shu'aib turned from them and said, O oh my people, I have indeed conveyed the message of my Lord to you, and I have given you good nasiha, good advice. Then how can I grieve for a disbelieving people? And we sent no prophet to any town, and they denied him, but we seize its people with suffering from extreme poverty and loss of health and calamities, so that they might humble themselves and repent to Allah. Then we changed the evil for the good until they increased in number and in wealth and said, our fathers were touched with evil and with good prosperity. So we seized them all, all of a sudden, while they were unaware. So what happens when a nation falls into sin? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends towards them a minor sign. So it can be some kind of illness, some kind of calamity, a temporary form of test. And this is sent in order to shake us up so that we can wake up. But when we keep on hitting that snooze button and keep falling to sleep and think that it is just a part of life, let's move on, no problem then that's where the problem happens. That's where the problem takes place. So these trials, these calamities, they come with a purpose. They come with a reason. And when they come to us, we should immediately repent to Allah and try to correct ourselves so that the evil can be replaced with good. The sickness, the calamity can be replaced with health, with happiness, with prosperity. And if the people of the towns had believed and had taqwa, had piety, certainly we should have opened for them blessings from the heaven and the earth. But they denied the messengers, so we took them with punishment for what they used to earn. Did the people of the towns then feel secure against the coming of our punishment by night while they were asleep? Or did the people of the towns then feel secure against the coming of our punishment in the forenoon while they were playing? Did they then feel secure against the plan of Allah? None feel secure from the plan of Allah except the people who are the losers. So we often translate our experience of security from feeling secure to being secure, when actually there are two different terms. Feeling secure is just a fleeting emotion, which does not guarantee us security itself. However, being secure endorses the fact that the security is going to be present substantially. So for instance, when we're eating in our favorite restaurant, it may make us feel secure because we are responding to our wishes. But the question is, is that state of happiness going to continue forever? No, it's not. When we are in the company of our loved ones, we feel secure. But will that company is going to stay with me forever? No, because I may die or they may die. So subhanAllah, the purpose of life is not just pleasure through other means. The purpose of life is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to seek the pleasure of Allah. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, by my honor, I shall never combine for my servant two securities nor two fears. 
If he feels secure of me in this dunya, I shall make him feel, I shall make him fear on the day that I gather my servants. And if a person feels afraid of me in this dunya, then I shall give him security on the day I gather my servants. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Rab, grant all of us security on the day of Qiyamah when everyone shall be gathered. Allahumma ameen. Ayah number 100, is it not clear to those who inherit the earth in succession from its previous possessors that all that they had we willed, we would have punished them for their sins, and we seal up their hearts so that they hear not? Those were the towns whose stories we relate to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and there came indeed to them their messengers with clear proofs, but they were not to believe in that which they had rejected before. Thus, Allah does seal up the hearts of the disbelievers, and most of them be found not true to their covenant, but most of them be found indeed rebellious. And then, of course, down the line after Shu'aib alayhi salam, many years later, in between our prophets, after them came Musa alayhi salam. So Allah says, then after them, we sent Musa with our signs to Fir'aun and his chiefs, but they wrongfully rejected them. So see, how was the end of the corruptors, mischief makers? And Musa said, O Fir'aun, verily, I am a messenger from the Lord of the Alameen. Proper it is for me that I say nothing concerning Allah, but the truth. Indeed, I have come to you from your Lord with a clear proof. So let the children of Israel depart along with me. So the reason why Musa salam, is taking the permission of Pharaoh to allow the children children of Israel to go with him was because of the fact that Pharaoh had enslaved the children of Israel. So after Yusuf alayhi salam, Bani Israel lived in Egypt in solace and peace for a long time. But down the line, a lot of corruption crept into them. And there were a lot of battles and fightings. And then finally, Fir'aun took over them. Corrupt leaders took over them and enslaved them. And that's when Musa alayhi salam was sent to Bani Israel in order to save them. Pharaoh said, if you have come with the sign, show it forth, if you are one of those who tell the truth. Then Musa alayhi salam threw his stick, and behold, it was a serpent manifest. So again, Fir'aun asked for a sign. He demanded a sign because people, they do not believe just like that. So they always react to, um, you know, to the claim with such certain measures. So they say, okay, fine, if you are a prophet, then prove it to me. Do you have any miracles that you perform? Do you have something special, which is a sign from Allah? So Musa alayhi salam, he threw his stick because that was a miracle which was given to him. That was a mu'ajiza. And which was that whenever he would throw his stick, it would become into a thu'aban. And thu'aban is not just a snake. In fact, it's a huge python. So that was one of the miracles that was given. Number two, and he drew out his hand and behold, it was white with radiance for the beholders. So that was another miracle that was given to Musa alayhi salam that each time he would take his hand out from his sleeve then it would become white with radiance, without any sickness, without any illness. So again, that was also something to prove others that yes, indeed, he is a prophet of Allah. So what did the people, how did the people react? The chiefs of the people of Fir'aun said, this is indeed a well-worst sorcerer. And again, subhanAllah, every time there is something which is a norm. So in the time of Musa alayhi salam, magic was the norm. People would practice magic. Sihr, magic was everywhere. So when Musa alayhi salam presented them these miracles, what did they say? They immediately accused him of magic. They said, he wants to get you out of your land. So what do you advise? 
And this is the irony of life. Whenever someone wants to give you good advice, what do people say? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to her. I know that he has a secret agenda that she's trying to fulfill. He has a secret plan that he's trying to achieve. And that's exactly what the chiefs of people, uh, what the chiefs of Pharaoh told him. They said, put him and his brother off for a time and send the callers to the cities to collect. And over here, the word hashirin is used. And hashirin and jami'in means kind of same thing because jami'a means to gather and hashir also means to gather. However, hashir means whether the people want to gather or not, doesn't matter. If you have to force them to come and gather, it's okay but they have to gather. And that's why one of the names of Qiyama is Yawmul Hashar, because every one of us, each one of us will be forced to gather in that, in that place, whether we want to or not. And then what happened? That they bring to you all well-versed sorcerers. So when they saw Musa alayhi salam presenting this miracle, they thought that this is magic. So they wanted to challenge Musa alayhi salam. So Fir'aun commanded his people, he commanded his soldiers to have a huge gathering, to have a carnival where all the sorcerers are supposed to come. And in that gathering, Musa alayhi salam is going to be challenged. And then we're going to see who is more powerful whether it's Fir'aun or whether it's Musa alayhi salam and his God. And so the sorcerers came to Fir'aun. They said, indeed, there will be a good reward for us if we are victorious. He said, yes, and moreover, you will be in that case, be of the nearest to me. So Pharaoh, he's smart. He is giving them a good reward. He's giving them a good prize, not just, you know, a gift card. Rather, he's giving them a cabinet position. So he's saying that if you work for me, if you win against Musa, then I'm going to give you a good cabinet position. So basically, he's trying to prove that you looking good is automatically going to make me look good. Right? So that's his plan. So what happened? The carnival started and everyone was gathered. The stage was set up. The people faced Musa alayhi salam and the sorcerers said, Oh Musa, either you throw first or shall we be the ones to throw first? Musa alayhi salam said, you throw first. So when they threw, they bewitched the eyes of the people and struck terror into them. And they displayed a great magic. Because magic was the norm, what happened, all these sorcerers gathered together. They all threw their stick and all their sticks turned into snakes. Allah says, and be revealed to Musa saying, throw your stick and behold, it swallowed up straight away all the falsehood which they showed. So subhanAllah, Musa alayhi salam, when he threw his stick, it actually became a huge python and it ate all the tiny snakes that were revolving going around on the floor. Because a mu'ajiza, a miracle, is different from sihr, which is magic. A mu'ajiza is a supernatural event that takes place with the izan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's 100% authentic and true. Whereas sihr, magic, is simply an illusion to the eye. And it is fake, and it is false. So Allah says, Thus the truth was confirmed, and all that they did was made of no effect. So they were defeated, and they returned disgraced. And the sorcerers fell down in prostration. They said, we believe in the Lord of the Alameen, the Lord of Musa and Harun. Fir'aun said, you have believed in him, in Musa alayhi salam, before I give you permission? 
surely this is a plot which you have plotted in the city to drive out its people, but you shall come to know. Again, we can see the arrogance of Pharaoh in this. He doesn't care whether these people are magicians or whether these people are Muslims. He doesn't care about their faith. All he cares about is how can you decide something before I give you the permission? Because I have an authority over you. I rule over, over you. So you need to listen to me. So he says, surely I will cut off your hands and your feet from opposite sides, then I will crucify you all. Again, the legacy of shaitan continued. Just like shaitan said that I'm going to stay in ambush for mankind and I'm going to tempt them from the right and the left, from the front and the back. Just like that, Fir'aun said, I'm going to punish these people by cutting off their hands and their feet from opposite sides. And to add more agony to it, I'm going to crucify them as well. So it was a huge threat. They said, verily, we are returning to our Lord. And you take vengeance on us only because we believed in the ayat of our Rabb when they reached us. Our Lord pour out on us patience and cause us to die as Muslims. So subhanAllah, over here we see that at that point of time, the magicians, they were expert at their magic. So they realized what was presented by Musa salam is not magic. So they immediately recognized the truth and they affirmed it. They believed it. And that's the reason why many years later down the line, People of Makkah, they were expert in Arabic language. So when Quran was presented to them, they knew exactly that this is not poetry. This is not sorcery. So that's why studying something is very important. That's why we're studying tafsir. We're studying the root words. We're going into the nitty gritties of the language. We're going into the depth of seeking knowledge so that the Quran can have an impact on our hearts because Quran has come for our guidance. And subhanAllah, a beauty that we see over here is the fact that they came as sorcerers in the beginning of the day. And subhanAllah, they are leaving the gathering being Muslims. And they are so strong in terms of their iman that they are saying, Rabbana afrig alayna sabran wa tawaffana muslimin. And afraga, coming from ifrag, means to pour out something. Like how you would pour the water out from a water jug. So they're asking Allah that, Ya Allah, grant us all the sabr patient supply which is out there. So that we can just download it in our system. SubhanAllah. And if we notice, this dua, Rabbana afriq alayna sabran, this is the same dua which is mentioned in Surah Baqarah when the people were fighting against the Jalut. SubhanAllah. It's possible that because the generation have retained their ancestral treasure, SubhanAllah, they are saying the same dua. SubhanAllah. So again, it teaches us that if we leave good remnants behind, if we teach our children good values, then inshallah, they can pass the legacy to their children and their children. And inshallah, we can have all of them as a sadaqa jariya for us. The chiefs of Fir'aun said, will you leave Musa and his people to spread mischief in the land and to abandon you and your gods? He said, we will kill their sons and let live, let alive their women. And we have indeed irresistible power over them. And imagine the scenario. If you were a woman at that time living in that time zone, in that time frame, and the law is passed that your son is going to be killed, your father, your husband, your brother, how would you feel? How would I feel? What would be the way out? Where would be the exit to flee? SubhanAllah. So the question pops up, could they rebel? If they had rebelled, situation would have actually worsened. 
So this was an incredibly difficult situation to bear. And we all go through such situations, even if they're not as tough as that. But still, we all go through such situations, which are trials, which are calamities. SubhanAllah. So say, for instance, childbirth. For any woman, it's a very difficult phase when she's in the emergency ward and there's no one to help her out. No one is able to take away 50% of her pain. What does she do? What do you do? We all seek the help of Allah. We make dua. So what did Musa salam said to them? Musa said to his people, seek help in Allah and be patient. Verily, the earth belongs to Allah. He gives it as a heritage to whom he wills of his slaves. And the blessed end is for the people who have taqwa. They said, we, the children of Israel, had suffered troubles before you came to us. And since you have come to us, he said, it may be that your Lord will destroy your enemy and make you successors on the earth so that he may see how you act. So now we can see the dilemma of the people, the situation of the people, how impatient they have become. And subhanAllah, it happens with many of us that when the test gets prolonged, what do we say? We say, I have been suffering in this marriage for 10 years. Why isn't Allah helping me? I am undergoing this hardship from 20 years. Why isn't Allah ending this? I'm done. I'm exhausted. I don't even think my du'as are being answered. So this is hastiness, and we should refrain from this from it. So children of Israel, they're also telling Musa alayhi salam that we have suffered a lot since you have come to us. So they're being ungrateful. But Musa alayhi salam is again consoling them and comforting them as a prophet. And indeed, we punished the people of Fir'aun with the years of drought and shortness of fruits, and they might remember, so that they might remember. But whenever good came to them, they said, Ours is this. And if evil afflicted them, they ascribed it to evil omens connected with Musa and those with him. Be informed, verily, their evil omens are with Allah, but most of them do not know. And again, this happens with us too, right? In psychology, it's called self serving bias. If children succeed in life, we think, Alhamdulillah. I worked so hard teaching them manners, teaching them knowledge, and today they're honored with such a high position. I'm so happy that all my efforts paid off. But perhaps if the situation is upside down and our children are ill-mannered and unsuccessful in terms of deen or dunya, what do we say? Actually, you know what? Their dad never spent time with them. Their failure is due to the negligence of their father, who was never there for them. So we happily give the credit, we happily take the credit for good, but we're ready to attribute the evil to someone else. So that's what exactly they did. They ascribed all the evil, what was happening to them, that it is because of the evil omen connected to Musa a.s. They said to Musa, whatever ayat you may bring to us to work, therewith your sorcery on us, we shall never believe in you. So we sent on them the flood, the locusts, the lice, the frogs, and the blood, manifest sign, yet they remained arrogant, and they were of those who were criminals. So from Ayah 129, we learned that Pharaoh gave Bani Israel a huge threat to kill their men. So what happened, Musa alayhi salam, he started making dua and he asked Pharaoh to allow Bani Israel to go with him to leave Egypt. However, Pharaoh, he refused. So when that happened, Allah sent a tufan on them. Allah sent a huge storm on them, a huge flood, followed by locusts. 
followed by lice. So what was this test? That wherever they would go, there would be locusts all around them to the point that when they would breathe, they would be just breathing them in. They would be in everywhere to their right, to their left. Then there were lice. They were tested with lice. There were lice everywhere. Frogs in their houses, pans, pots, etc. Each time they would just pick up the pot to eat something, there would be frog jumping out of it. So each time the people of Pharaoh would come to Musa alayhi salam to say that if you pray to God to remove this punishment from us, we will believe in your God. So the people of Pharaoh, they would come to Musa alayhi salam with this request that whatever is happening to us, it's because of you, all these trials, all, all, all these calamities. And if you take them away from us, then we're going to believe in your God. But each time Musa alayhi salam would make dua, Allah would remove the punishment from them. What would they do? They would go back on their words. So then Allah would send a sign again. Allah would send an affliction upon them again. So the last sign which came on them was when the whole river Nile, when the entire water turned into blood. So whenever they would see the water, it would look like water. But as soon as they would try to drink or take a bath in that water, using that water, it would turn into blood. And interestingly, these punishments would only affect the, uh, the Egyptians. And these Egyptians, they were the elites. So the elites of the society, they lived separately from Bani Israel because these people were poor and lowly. So they lived in the downskirts and the outskirts of the city. So since the Egyptians, they belong to the high class society that composed of uh, their own society, their own community. So all these tests were taking place with them. While the Bani Israel living on the other end, they were able to drink water normally. They were not afflicted with frogs and with lice whatsoever. SubhanAllah, so this was definitely an exclusive punishment sent towards them. And it's mentioned in the books of Tafasir that each punishment would continue for seven days, followed by a one month gap. So Allah gave them one month period to repent, to reflect, to ponder, and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, return to him. But each time they would turn back on their word and they would not listen and they would persist to reject the message of Allah. That's when Allah would send another punishment on them, another sign so that they may take, take heed. And when the punishment fell on them, they said, O Musa, invoke your Lord for us because of his promise to you. If you remove the punishment from us, we indeed shall believe in you and we shall let the children of Israel go with you as well. But when we remove the punishment from them into a fixed storm, which they had to reach, behold, they broke their word. So we took retribution from them. We drowned them in the sea because they denied our ayat and they were heedless about them. And we made the people who were considered weak to inherit the eastern parts of the land and the western parts thereof, which we have blessed. And the fair word of your Lord was fulfilled for the children of Israel because of their endurance. And we destroyed completely all the great works and the buildings which Fir'aun and his people erected. And we brought the children of Israel with safety across the sea. And they came upon a people devoted to some of their idols in worship. They said, O Musa, make for us a God as they have gods. He said, verily, you are a people who do not know. SubhanAllah, this is so much ignorance that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Bani Israel from Fir'aun and his affliction and drowned Fir'aun and his entire army, what is Bani Israel doing right now? After being safely secure, they're asking Musa alayhi salam to make an ilah for them, to carve an idol for them so that they can worship. So Musa alayhi salam said, Inna kum Indeed, you are a very ignorant nation. 
Musa alayhi salam added, verily, these people will be destroyed for that which they are engaged in, which means these people who are indulging in idol worship, don't take a lesson from them, don't try to copy them because they're going to be destroyed. And all that they are doing is in vain. He said, shall I seek for you a God other than Allah? while he has given you superiority over the mankind, over the jinn. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And remember when we rescued you from Fir'aun's people who were afflicting you with the worst torment, killing your sons and letting your women live? And in that was a great trial from your Lord. So SubhanAllah, this was a huge trial from, for them. They were living in so much affliction. They were being enslaved from, uh, by Fir'aun. And after Allah saved them from all that affliction, from all that calamity and trial, Musa is shocked that how could you even think about worshiping anyone other than Allah? And we appointed for Musa 30 nights and added to the period 10 more. And he completed the term appointed by his Lord of 40 nights. And Musa said to his brother Harun, replace me among my people. Act in the right way by ordering the people to obey Allah and follow not the people who are mischief makers. And when Musa came at the time and place appointed by us and his Lord spoke to him, he said, O oh my Lord, show me yourself. So he said, allow me, ya Allah, to have one glimpse of you. Because ara means a glimpse, a glance. So that I may look at you. And nazara means to stare. Allah said, you cannot see me, but look upon the mountain. Meaning you cannot even have a single glimpse of me. Rather, you should look and stare nazara at the mountain. If it stands still in its place, then you shall see me. So when his Lord appeared to the mountain, he made it collapse to dust. And Musa fell down unconscious. Then when he recovered his senses, he said, glorified are you. I turn to you in repentance and I am one of the believers. SubhanAllah. So when you love someone a lot, you want to keep talking to them, right? You want to keep looking at them, whether they are your children, whether they are your parents. You have this urge to keep looking at them and to continue the conversation. Just like we make a lot of dua that hopefully someday I'm able to see the Prophet Sallallahu in my dream. Just like that, Musa alayhi salam, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Ya Allah, I want to see you. I want to look at you. But the instance that followed, the incident that followed after that portrayed that this is a blessing which is only reserved for Jannah. It is not possible for the people in dunya to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's a special gift which is reserved for the inhabitants of Jannah. Allah said, O Musa, I have chosen you above men by my messages and by my speaking to you. So hold that which I have given you and be of the grateful. And we wrote for him on the tablets the lesson to be drawn from all things and the explanation for all things and said, hold to these with firmness and enjoin your people to take the better therein. I shall show you the home of the rebellious. I shall turn away from my ayat those who behave arrogantly on the earth without a right and even if they see all the ayat they will not believe in them and if they see the way of righteousness they will not adopt it as the way but if they see the way of error they will adopt that way that is because they have rejected our ayat and were heedless to learn a lesson from them those who deny our ayat and the meeting in the hereafter wane are their deeds. Are they requited with anything except what they used to do? And the people of Musa made in his absence out of their ornaments the image of a calf for worship. It had a sound as if it was mooing. Did they not see that it could neither speak to them nor guide them to the way? They took it for worship and they were wrongdoers. 
So what happened was that Musa alayhi salam had to go on the mountain to receive Tawra. And he stayed there for 40 nights. So during this time, he appointed Harun alayhi salam to be in charge over the people. However, the people rebelled against Harun alayhi salam and they did as per their desire. And they carved out of their ornaments an image of a calf and they took it in, they took it for worship. So Allah says, they were indeed wrongdoers when they did this. And when they regretted and saw that they had gone astray, they repented and said, if our Lord have not mercy upon us and forgive us, we shall certainly be of the losers. And when Musa returned to his people, angry and grieved, he said, what an evil thing is that which you have done during my absence. Did you hasten and go ahead as regards the matter of your Lord? And he threw down the tablets and seized his brother by the hair of the head and dragged him towards him. Harun said, O son of my mother, indeed the people judged me weak and were about to kill me, so do not make the enemies rejoice over me, nor put me amongst the people who are wrongdoers. So when Musa alayhi salam came and he saw the scene, what the people are doing, he became extremely upset because anger is a human instinct. So we see that initially Musa alayhi salam, he did got angry. He did become extremely upset. But when he overcame his anger, when he was able to overcome his anger, he made dua. Musa alayhi salam said, Oh my Lord, forgive me and my brother and admit us into your mercy, for you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. Certainly those who took the calf for worship, wrath from their Lord and humiliation will come upon them in the life of this world. Thus do we recompense those who invent lies. So yes, sometimes we become angry. And as a result of anger, we further harm someone. We further hurt someone by saying certain things, by acting in a certain way. So what is the solution? What should we do? We should make dua and we should seek forgiveness from Allah and from that person. But those who committed evil deeds and then repented afterwards and believed, verily your Lord after all, that is indeed oft forgiving and most merciful. And when the anger of Musa was calmed down, he took up the tablets and in their inscription was guidance and mercy for those who fear their Lord. And Musa salam chose out of his people 70 of the best men for our appointed time and place of meeting. And when they were seized with a violent earthquake, he said, oh, my Lord, if it it if it if it had been your will, you could have destroyed them and me before. Would you destroy us for the deeds of the foolish ones amongst us? It is only your trial by which you lead astray whom you will and keep guided whom you will. You are our protector. So forgive us and have mercy on us for you are the best of those who forgive. So after the Israelites were left with Harun alayhi salam, while Musa alayhi salam went to receive Torah, just like we said before, they started worshiping the calf. So as an expiation to their sin, they were commanded that the innocent ones should kill the idol worshipers. And after they did that, they were repentant. However, 70 pious people amongst them wanted to repent to Allah directly. So Musa alayhi salam took them to Mount Tur and he asked them to wait while he speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the high elevation of the mountain. And then when he returned back to them, instead of repenting to Allah, they said to Musa alayhi salam that we are only going to believe in Allah if we truly see Allah with our, with our own eyes. So what happened? The ground shook. And the 70 men were struck with a lightning bolt and they fell down dead. So Musa alayhi salam, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them up because these were the 70 best men from his people, from his ummah. So he pleaded to Allah to bring them back to life. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he accepted his dua and they were resurrected. And ordain for us good in this world and in the hereafter, certainly we have turned to you. He said, as to my punishment, I afflict therewith whom I will, and my mercy embraces all things. That mercy I shall ordain for those who are the pious, and who give zakah, and those who believe in our ayat. Those who follow the messenger, the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who can neither read nor write whom they find written with them in Torah and the Injil with them. So this is a proof, this ayah is a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned about the last prophet to come in the Torah and the Injil. He commands them for al-ma'ruf. So this is what the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does. He commands the people to do good and he forbids them from munkar. He forbids them to stay away from evil. He allows them as lawful at tayyibat all the good and lawful things. And he prohibits them as unlawful al khabaith all the evil and unlawful things. He releases them from their heavy burdens and from the fetters bindings that were upon them. So those who believe in him, help him, honor him, and follow the light, this Quran, which has been sent down with him, it is they who will be successful. So isr means the heavy loads of bricks and construction that the people used to carry on their backs. And aqlal means the chains that the people used to drag heavy materials. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been sent in order to take the people out from their isr, from their aqlal, from their heavy loads, and from their heavy bindings and heavy customs and cultures. So the Prophet Sallallahu has been sent in order to free us from a lot of customs that we have built for us, that we have made incumbent upon us, whether it's the custom of dowry, or whether it's the custom of having lavish weddings, or what not. Islam is a solution for all problems. And if we follow the Prophet ﷺ by following the Quran, that's how Allah says we will be successful. Say, O Muhammad ﷺ, O mankind, verily I am sent to you all as a messenger to Allah, to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. None has the right to be worshipped but he. It is he who gives life and causes death. So believe in Allah and his messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write, who believes in Allah and his words and follow him so that you may be guided. And of the people of Musa, there is a community who lead the men with truth and establish justice. And we divided them into 12 tribes as distinct nations. We revealed to Musa when his people asked him for water, saying, strike the stone with your stick. And there gushed forth out of it 12 springs. Each group knew its own place for water. We shaded them with clouds and sent down upon them alman and quail. So we gave them a dessert and we gave them food, meat to eat. Eat of the good things that which we have provided you. They harmed us not, but they used to harm themselves. So again, Allah reminds that these were the blessings that were given to them. They were given food, they were given water, and in fact, they were even given shade from the clouds, yet they disobeyed Allah. So how did they disobey Allah? Allah says, and remember when it was said to them, dwell in this town, Jerusalem, and eat therefrom wherever you wish. And say, O oh Allah, forgive our sins and enter the gate, prostrating, bowing with humility. We shall forgive you your wrongdoings. We shall increase the reward for the good doers. So when they were told to enter the city, they were told to say, Hittatun, which meant another word to say, offload our sins. Ya Allah, forgive us. What did they do? They changed the word. 
Allah said, had they done that, then Allah would have forgiven them. But those among them who did wrong changed the word that had been told to them. So we sent on them a torment from the heaven in return for their wrongdoings. And ask them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa about the town that was by the sea, when they transgressed in the matter of Sabbath Saturday, when their fish came to them openly on the Sabbath day and did not come to them on the day they had no Sabbath. Thus we made a trial of them, for they used to rebel against the commands of Allah. And when a community among them said, why do you preach to a people whom Allah is about to destroy or to punish with a severe torment? The preacher said, in order to be free from guilt before your Lord, and perhaps they may fear Allah. And when they forgot the remindings that had been given to them, we rescued those who forbade evil. But with a severe torment, we seized those who did wrong because they used to rebel against the commands of Allah. So over here, there are three groups mentioned. There are three groups mentioned in the case in the story of Sabbath. One group admonished the sinners, while the other group remained silent. And the third group was the group of sinners. In all three groups, what did Allah do? Allah punished the sinners. Allah rescued the group who admonished the sinners. However, the third group who were passive, Allah doesn't mention anything about them. So this was the group who was doing good, but they were not reprimanding others. Allah doesn't mention anything about them. So what does it teach us? It teaches us that as a person who is a believer, who's following Islam, we have to be a preacher as well. It's not sufficient enough for us to pray and recite the Quran. Rather, we have to teach this to our children as well, to our relatives as well, to our communities as well. Allah says, so when they exceeded the limits of what they were prohibited, we said to them, be you monkeys, despised and rejected. So when the people exceeded the limits, they transgressed. This was the torment that these people, they were transformed into apes, into monkeys. And remember when your Lord declared that he would certainly keep on sending against them, uh, the Jews till the day of resurrection, those who would afflict them with a humiliating torment, verily your Lord is quick in retribution. And certainly he is oft forgiving, most merciful. And we have broken them up into various separate groups on the earth. Some of them are righteous and some are away from that. And we tested them with blessings and evil calamities in order that they might turn to the obedience of Allah. Then after them succeeded an evil generation which inherited the book, but they chose for themselves the good of this lowly life, saying as an excuse that everything will be forgiven to us. And if Allah... And if again the offer of the like came their way, they would again seize them. They would commit sins. Was not the covenant of the book taken from them that they would not say about Allah anything but the truth? And they have studied what is in this book and the home of the hereafter is better for those who are pious. Do you then not understand? And as to those who hold fast to the book and perform salah, certainly we shall never waste the reward of those who do good. And remember, when we raised the mountain over them as if it had been a canopy and they thought that it was going to fall on them, we said, hold firmly to what we have given you. And remember that which is therein. Act on its commands so that you may fear Allah and obey him. So what happened after the 70 men, they returned from Mount Thor with Musa alayhi salam. They told the Israelites that Allah has commanded injunctions in this book. However, you only need to follow what you can and you will be forgiven for what you cannot. And again, this is blasphemous. Just now, subhanAllah, you demanded to see Allah. And subhanAllah, you were afflicted with a torment. You became dead. 
And because of dua of Musa alayhi salam, you were resurrected alive and now you go to your people and say this. So subhanAllah, because they added such a condition for obedience, Allah ordered that Mount Tur be raised above their heads and ordered them at, you know, kind of gunpoint that you should accept the orders of Allah. You have to accept the orders of Allah. Otherwise, this mountain is going to fall upon you and crush you. <laughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the people of that incident as well. And remember when your Lord brought forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their seed, and made them testify as to themselves, saying, am I not your Lord? They said, yes, we testify, Ya Rabb lest you should say on the day of resurrection, verily we have been unaware of this. So this is referring to the wadi alas, to the promise that was taken with our arwah, with our ruh, with our souls, long before we were born. So after our creation, but before we were born, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered all of us and took this promise. And we testify to this claim that yes, we firm the fact that you are our Lord. Allah says, or lest you should say, it was only our fathers aforetime who took others as partners in worship along with Allah, and we were merely their descendants after them. Will you then destroy us because of the deeds of men who practiced batil, who committed wrong? Thus do we explain the ayat in detail so that they may turn to the truth. And recite, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to them, the story of him who, whom we gave our ayat, but he threw them away. So shaitan followed him up, and he became of those who went astray. So Allah is giving an analogy of a person who was a learned person, who was the follower of Islam, who was a student of Quran, but soon after, shaitan followed him and he left everything. This world deluded him to the fact that he pursued sins instead of good deeds. He pursued the pleasure of this world instead of seeking the pleasure of Akhirah. So Allah says, and had we willed, we would surely have elevated him therewith, but he clung to the earth and followed his own vain desire. So his parable is the parable of a dog. If you drive him away, he lulls his tongue out. If you leave him alone, he still lulls his tongue out. Such is the parable of the people who reject our ayat. So relate to the stories. Perhaps they may reflect. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an analogy of a person whose priorities have changed. For them, salah is not important because money has more priority. For them, Quran is not important because seeking the pleasures of dunya is more priority. So Allah says their analogy is just like a dog who is yalhath, who's sticking his tongue out and breathing heavily and panting which tells us that Allah makes this person's thirst for dunya never ending. Just like a dog lulls his tongue out, just like that, they are always in the pursuit of fulfilling their desires. And no matter how much dunya, how much pleasures of this world they accumulate, they still want more and more. And nothing gives them contentment because the true contentment of heart lies in the Quran, in the remembrance of Allah, in the dhikr of Allah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this Quran a coolness of our eyes, to make our salah a contentment for our hearts. Allahumma amin. So with that said, inshallah, we're going to conclude our session for, for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka 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 wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma rhamni bil Quran al-azmim. Waj'alhu li imamun wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. اللهم ذكرني من هما نسيت و 
علمني منه ما جهلت ورزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار وجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين يا الله divert our restlessness in the grave into peace يا الله let us receive your mercy by means of the noble Quran and make it a guide as well as a source of light guidance and grace for us يا الله revive our memory of whatever we are made to forget from the noble Quran Grant us understanding of whatever part we do not know. Enable us to recite it during the hours of the day and night and make it a main argumentative support for all of us, O nourisher of the worlds. Ya Allah, we ask you to, uh, to prevent us from arrogance, to prevent us from pride, from boastfulness. And Ya Allah, we ask you to make us humble, just like Adam alayhi salam, just like Musa alayhi salam, just like all the prophets. Ya Allah, we ask you to make our children, our parents, our family members, all our community members, on Hidayah, upon Hidayah, followers of your deen, Ya Allah, we ask you to grant guidance to all the generations to come. Ya Allah, grant all of us kalima tayyiba so that, Ya Allah, we all can have a good ending and a blessed death. Allahumma ameen. Ya Allah, cure the people who are sick. Grant them complete shifa. Ya Allah, forgive the people who have passed away. Forgive them and, and elevate their ranks. Ya Allah, make our children and our families a coolness for our eyes. Rabbirhamhuma kama rabbayani sagheera. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurrata a'ayun wa ja'alna lilmuttaqina imama. Ya Allah, let our thirst for Qur'an never end. Rabbi sidni alma. Ya Allah, grant us knowledge. Allahumma faqihna fid deen. Allahumma ameen. So with that said, inshallah, we're going to conclude. Jazakumullahul khayran kaseera. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.